You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy, new fellow orientation series from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 8, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, drug allergy. Our presenter is Dr. David Kahn. He's the Director of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. This morning, uh, we're starting a, a summer series of conferences uh, that are general topics in allergy and immunology. Um, um, we've been doing this for a number of years and for the last about three years on COLA. Um, I've been able to get um, a number of um, excellent speakers from across the country to agree to speak this summer on just general topics in allergy immunology, especially suited for the new fellows. And the first one to start off the bat um, this summer in the series is Dr. David Kahn. Um, <clears throat> he's the uh, training program director at um, University of Texas Southwest um, in Dallas, and he's an expert on drug allergy, and I'm very pleased that he's willing to give us a talk this morning. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. Well, very good. Good, good, good morning, everyone. Um, so... Uh, Thanks for inviting me to be part of the uh, COLA series again. And so this, uh, as you've heard, is going to be an overview on, on, on drug allergy. And we'll go through some of the obligatory things here. Oh, oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't really have any disclosures that are relevant to this uh, topic. And the objectives uh, for the, the, the lecture are to get an understanding about the different types of classification schemes that we use in uh, drug allergy and to be able to recognize that there are limitations with whichever form that you use. We'll talk a little bit about the fact that drug allergy is a whole bunch of different things and there are certain syndromes of drug allergy that are important for us as allergists to be able to recognize. And then we'll talk about some of the diagnostic tests that we can use uh, in drug allergy. We'll talk about some of the specific drugs. Um, and then at the end, talk about how do we manage uh, patients. So, and throughout this, I've inserted uh, several different key points. I think there are 14 key points. And the first key point, uh, which I think is something that we all know, but many patients and sometimes other physicians don't quite recognize, is the fact that an adverse drug reaction does not equate with drug allergy, and that drug allergy is just a subset of adverse drug reactions. So this is an old classification scheme that talks about type A and type B reactions. Type A reactions are the most common types of adverse drug reactions and are basically predictable based on the known pharmacologic effects of the drug uh, and really don't really have anything to do with the uh, host itself. So Examples of type A reactions would be renal failure from aminoglycosides, if you get drowsy from taking diphenhydramine, uh, diarrhea from antibiotics, and so on. Uh, typical adverse uh, drug reactions. Now, type B reactions is what we're going to be talking about. And these are uh, unpredictable, occur in a small subset of patients, and may definitely have something to do with the host uh, itself. Now, not all type B reactions are considered allergic reactions. So, for example, in patients with G6PD deficiency who can have hemolysis when they take something like Dapsone, that would not be considered uh, an, a drug allergy, but is indeed a type B unpredictable type of reaction. We're going to be talking about hypersensitivity reactions and pseudoallergic reactions, et cetera, and we'll talk more about how we might uh, define these a little bit further. All right, the second thing, uh, key point, is that there are lots of different types of drug allergies. Uh, as you'll find out, uh, when you get a, a, a called on the phone from um, uh, a service and they want, uh, they'll ask you for a consult, they'll oftentimes say, you know, I've got a patient who has this drug allergy to this. Uh, can you go ahead and desensitize them? And uh, typically, what you don't even know what kind of reaction they've had and whether it's even appropriate to do a desensitization. So I think there's a common misconception that all drug allergies are just one and the same, and they're clearly not. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, proposed hypotheses 
in drug allergy. And there are three uh, uh, hypotheses. Uh, the first one is the so-called Hapton hypothesis, and this is the oldest one that's shown uh, here on the left. And the prototypical example is penicillin. So as, as you know, most drugs are fairly small molecular weight compounds and by themselves are not immunogenic and recognized by the immune system. So penicillin is no exception and it requires antigen uh, processing and gets linked to a uh, carrier protein uh, uh, that's a self protein like albumin and then it gets processed and then becomes a larger uh, immunogenic uh, haptonated protein. And so this is the hapton hypothesis and explains a lot of penicillin allergy. Now similar to this hypothesis is in the middle uh, column here, the prohaptin hypothesis. And this is exemplified by sulfamethoxazole. Now in this case, it's not sulfamethoxazole that's the hapton, but it's the metabolite of sulfamethoxazole, a nitroso compound, which then binds to protein and then goes through the same process and uh, becomes the uh, allergen. Now, a more recent uh, hypothesis is in the far right column. Here it's labeled as the non-hapton, uh, but it often goes by the PI concept or pharmacologic interaction. And the idea here is that the drug itself is interacting directly with the T cell receptor um, and uh, can, 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 can bind here and cause uh, activation. And this has been shown with a number of different drugs, including sulfamethoxazole, some of the anticonvulsants, et cetera. So this is a newer hypothesis uh, about uh, various types of immune uh, drug reactions. Now, when we see patients, uh, one of the things that I think is useful to do is try and uh, determine, can we categorize their type of reaction? And there are well-known adaptive immune responses, and probably the most common uh, that we use in drug allergy is the Gell and Coombs hypersensitivity classification. And as you recall from medical school, type 1 is IgE-mediated, type 2 is antibody-mediated cytotoxicity, type 3 is immune complex reactions, and type 4 are delay-type hypersensitivity. This is still a useful classification scheme, and you can uh, apply this to patients with drug allergic reactions, and for many, uh, this will work. However, there are certain drug reactions where this is not very helpful. Now, more recently, the delay-type hypersensitivity category has been subdivided um, to, to how we can apply it to drug allergy. And Werner Pieschler is the one who has done a lot of uh, in vitro work in drug allergy and has subcategorized these into four different types. And this is based on the immune response. So you can see that they're lettered A through D, and the immune responses are specifically T cell responses, but some are Th1, some are Th2, cytotoxic T cells, and those that produce uh, interleukin-8. The pathology will b vary between these different subtypes, but if you look at the reaction clinically, what you can see is there may be similarities. So you can see maculopapular eruptions for the type 4B and type C. You can see pustular reactions. So looking at the patient, you may not be able to determine what the specific immunopathology is, is going on. And so it's a little difficult to know can we apply this directly uh, today at the bedside? Um, but I think it, it, it is a, a, an advance, and hopefully we'll see more of this in terms of really uh, further delineation of these type of reactions. Now, other immunologic uh, uh, classifications are with the non-adaptive immune system or the innate immune responses, and pseudoallergic reactions, drugs that cause complement activation, or drugs that cause apoptosis can be uh, in this category. And then there would be non-immunologic responses, so bradykinin-mediated reaction and reactions due to toxic drug metabolites might fit in this. So as you can see, there's a lot of different mechanistic ways that one can try and classify drug reactions. And the better you can do this, the more helpful it is to try and figure out what are you going to do with this patient down the road. 
Now, certain risk factors uh, may be at play in, in drug allergy, and some are drug-related, and some might be related to the patients themselves. So large molecular weight agents can be immunogenic themselves. What is, has been observed is that parenteral uh, drugs are more likely to cause reactions than orally administered drugs and probably even more than topically administered drugs. Dose can be an important factor as well as how often the patient is receiving the drug and if it's uh, recurrent uh, uh, courses may be more sensitizing. Now individual factors, as it turns out, uh, women are more likely to develop drug reactions and it's not entirely clear why that is. ATP is not a universal thing for drug allergy. Only certain types of drug reactions are associated with ATP. Mastocytosis can be associated with certain drug reactions. And then more recently, genetics has been looked at in terms of risk factors for drug allergy. And some of the more uh, highly publicized uh, pharmacogenetics are shown in this table. The first one that was really mapped out was the association between this particular allele, HLA-B1502, and carbamazepine-induced Stevens-Johnson syndrome. And this was found to be highly associated in a certain ethnicity, that of the Han Chinese. And it's currently recommended by the FDA that prior to starting carbamazepine, you do some type of genetic screening for this allele. Now, uh, allopurinol has been associated with a different allele, and it's been shown in more than just the Han Chinese population, also Europeans and Japanese, in terms of causing severe cutaneous adverse reactions. But to date, this has not been recommended as a screening tool. The drug that has received the most uh, attention has been abacavir, uh, which is a uh, HIV medication and causes a particular syndrome called abacavir hypersensitivity syndrome, which is a multi-organ drug reaction which can be life-threatening. And this occurs in a variety of different uh, ethnicities and has been highly linked with this HLA-B5701. And genetic screening is recommended. And in fact, there was a trial that looked at taking patients and screening them prior to abacavir and seeing did screening for this allele reduce the incidence of this hypersensitivity syndrome. And in fact, it did. And that was another impotence for using this type of genetic screening. So as we move forward, hopefully we'll have more tools so that we can avoid some of these uh, reactions in the first place by screening patients at high risk. But as you can see, it's a relatively small number of drugs. And uh, so we're not there yet. Hey, Dave, are these tests readily available? So for abacavir, it's certainly uh, readily available. And for carbamazepine, it's not hard to get uh, as well. I do not know about allopurinol, but uh, yeah, th th you can get these. These are commercially available kits that, that, that one can get. Hmm. Um, all right, the next key point is that drug allergies can manifest in a, a variety of different uh, ways. So one example, and the most common way that drug allergies present is with cutaneous drug reactions. And this is a list of some of the more uh, common and some less common uh, drug reactions. And we'll talk about some of these in a little bit more detail, particularly exanthems and urticaria and angioedema. But it's important to recognize that you can get six drug eruptions, pustules, bullous reactions, even cutaneous lupus as a manifestation of drug allergy. Now, other organs can be involved as well, not just the skin. So you can get hematologic reactions, liver reactions, lung reactions. And, and kidney involvement uh, solely as a manifestation of drug allergy. And then finally, one can get multi-organ drug allergic reactions. Um, the uh, acronym that's currently being used to describe the severe drug reactions is SCAR, which stands for Severe Cutaneous Adverse Reactions. And this includes actually four different types of reactions. It includes one called acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, which I haven't included here. Not clear to me exactly why it's considered a severe reaction, because actually its prognosis is quite benign. And the ones we typically think of severe reactions are the DRESS syndrome, which we'll be talking a little bit about, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and TEN. And we'll talk a little bit more about that further. Anaphylaxis is a classic multi-organ 
manifestation of, of drug reactions as well as other different types of reactions. And then serum sickness, loop, systemic lupus, and vasculitis are some other forms of multi-organ drug reactions. So as you can see, clinically, drug reactions can respond, a uh, drug allergy can present in a variety of different manifestations. Now, the other key point is that the rash itself may help you in terms of classification in what to do and what you can tell patients about their uh, drug reaction. So uh, if, it, if you just see a rash, it doesn't tell you much, and it's good to really define what are we talking about. Now, this is, uh, oops, ignore that. Uh, this is a uh, drug, uh, an article that reviews cutaneous reactions to drugs. And I would highly recommend it if you're interested in looking at just the plethora of, of, of cutaneous reactions. But it shows, just goes to show, there's a lot of different reactions that have been attributed to drugs, more than just maculopapular eruptions in urticaria. But let's start with the common things. And urticaria and angioedema is near and dear to our heart as allergists. And I think we tend to think of this as being IgE-mediated. But it's important to remember that you can have other non-IgE-dependent urticaria angioedema as manifestations of drug allergies. So pseudoallergic reactions, serum sickness, bradykinin-mediated, and even other uh, manifestations. So with IgE-mediated reactions, the history should be that within minutes or even an hour or so of getting exposed to the drug that you have the reaction and that there is some history of prior sensitization that this would typically not be a first dose phenomenon. In addition to urticaria, you can have a variety of other symptoms that we're uh, familiar with. Now when you're asking patients the history of their reaction and they say, well I had hives with this, what you really want to know is were they really hives? Because most patients, and in fact, many physicians aren't able to really identify urticaria. One thing that you can ask them is, did their rash, did it eventually peel or did it cause any scarring? Because if it did, that wouldn't be urticaria, which shouldn't cause any of those events. Now this is a patient uh, that we uh, were doing a drug challenge and has classic urticarial eruption. In this case, it was not an IgE-mediated reaction, but this was more of a pseudoallergic reaction from aspirin. Now, pseudoallergic reactions can, by their name, resemble IgE-mediated reactions, but they're IgE-independent and are similarly resulted from mast cell degranulation, but through an IgE-independent fashion. Here, you can have first-dose reactions, and you can have even hypotension from pseudoallergic reactions. And some of the classic examples would be vancomycin or opiates. Now, here's a patient who has had life-threatening uh, airway edema. And in this case, this was from an ACE inhibitor. And again, not an IgE-mediated uh, phenomena, but this was a bradykinin-mediated ACE inhibitor angioedema. Now, the most common cutaneous manifestation of drug allergy is the drug exanthem pictured here. Drug exanthems, or maculopapular eruptions, are defined by having, they typically will have fairly small uh, papules or macules that can then coalesce to larger plaques. They typically start on the trunk and then spread in a symmetric fashion to the extremities, are almost always fairly pruritic uh, in nature. So this is the most common cutaneous drug allergic reaction. The pathophysiology for most of these is thought to be T cell mediated. And the onset is a little slower, so this will take days or sometimes even longer before it's manifest. Um, oftentimes, this will resolve with scaling or peeling. And importantly, when you see this, you don't need to worry that this is going to evolve into anaphylaxis because the mechanism is completely different. Now, potentially early on, you might be concerned that this could evolve into a more serious type of drug reaction. But if you've seen the patient for many days, um, it probably is not, is, is, is not going to evolve any further. Oops. Let me go back here. So this is a, 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 an example of the evolution of a drug exanthem. You can see on the left when this patient was in the hospital what it looked like. And here on the right, 
Um, you can see the scaling uh, and the resolution of this about four days later, and you can also see where the patient had skin biopsies to determine what was going on. All right, well, let's talk briefly about severe cutaneous adverse uh, reactions or SCAR. I'm not really going to be talking about AGEP. It's a fairly rare uh, uh, drug reaction. Let's talk about Stevens-Johnson and, and toxic epidermal necrolysis. As it turns out, we now believe that this is really the spectrum of the same disorder. And the more um, severe the reaction, the more um, skin involvement we call that TEN. Both of these disorders have skin and mucosal involvement. Both can be multi-organ uh, involvement. And the mortality can range uh, from 5 to as much as 40% or even higher. And there is a scoring system for TEN, which can give you prognostic factors in relation to mortality. Now, there are certain patients who are at higher risk, patients with HIV, lupus, bone marrow transplant. And then there are certain drugs that are more commonly associated with these reactions. These are some of the older ones in black, um, some of the anticonvulsants, sulfonamide, non-steroidals. But some newer agents have cropped up, uh, such as uh, lamotrigine, sertraline, and interestingly, pentroprazole and tramadol, which we oftentimes don't think of as being important uh, causes of severe drug reactions. But now I think it's important to recognize that there may be other drugs that can be associated with these severe drug reactions. This is a patient who I had on my medicine wards who was HIV positive, was placed on uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and within uh, several days developed this fairly um, uh, typical uh, exanthem, but not very characteristic of anything. But if you look at his palms, you can see more dusky lesions. You can see some desquamation. And then when you look at his face, you can see involvement of the oral mucosa. You can see involvement of the nares here. And so this was a patient who had Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Now, toxic epidermal necrolysis has more widespread involvement. Here we're having more than 30% of the skin involved. And due to the widespread apoptosis, you can see a detachment of the skin just from pressing on this, and this is called Mikulski sign. Now, a newer term is something called DRESS, or drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. This has gone by a lot of different names over the years, and this is the one that's probably most currently used, although it's still not agreed upon that this is the best name for it. Uh, the characteristics of this reaction is the rash can look like anything, so that's not very helpful. But it usually has fever, many times has eosinophilia, and can also have hepatic dysfunction, lymphadenopathy. So this is a multi-organ uh, reaction. What's unusual is that this takes a fair amount of time, many weeks for it to develop, and can persist long after the drug is discontinued. There are a number of common causes, anticonvulsants, sulfonamide, Minocycline, which is an unusual uh, drug uh, allergic cause, but is commonly seen with threats, and allopurinol, and a number of others. The most common antibiotic lately has been vancomycin associated with threats. This is a patient um, sh showing the kind of nonspecific drug eruption here. They oftentimes have a facial edema, not really angioedema, but just everything looks a little swollen. Uh, oftentimes, the ears become very uh, disfigured, but it really doesn't look like angioedema, but it can be con confused for angioedema. And this is what the patient uh, looked like uh, uh, normally. This occurred about a month after being started on minocycline for rosacea. Now, let's talk about some of the specific drugs and examples of their allergic reactions. We'll have another key point here. Most patients who are labeled allergic to penicillin are not. And most patients who really were allergic to penicillin in the past lose their allergy over time. So here's kind of penicillin allergy by the numbers. As it turns out, that 90% of patients with a history of penicillin allergy will tolerate penicillin. If you look over time, about 80% of patients lose their uh, IgE at about 10 years, 
about 50% at five years. So the natural history of penicillin allergy is to wane over time. Now the problem is, is that about a third of patients with vague histories have positive penicillin skin tests. To further complicate matters, the question is, is the detection of specific IgE to penicillin sensitization equate with drug allergy? And the answer is probably not. Um, now, penicillin skin testing has been around uh, for a long time. We didn't have it for many years. And now within the last few years, the major determinant is commercially available again. The major determinant is benzyl penicillin polylysine, which is commercially available as prepen. Minor determinants include penicillinate, penicillinate, and penicillin G. Now, what you can get is uh, prepen. Uh, this comes from ALK, and you can skin test it at the at the concentration. Penicillin G is the only minor determinant that's commercially available. Uh, we use this product called Pfizer Pen. comes in 5 million unit vials. You uh, reconstitute according to manufacturer's uh, recommendations, which leaves a million units per ml. And then you do a 1 to 100 dilution to make it 10,000 units per ml, which is the concentration you want to test with. Now, penicillin or penicillin, you need to uh, make in a chemistry lab. And uh, there's a reference from Eric Macy in terms of how to do that if you're so inclined. But the reality is most allergists in this country do not use minor determinant. And the question is, is that good enough? Well, if you look at studies, and there have been a few studies looking at taking patients who are penicillin allergic and testing just with prepen and penicillin G, and then challenging if they're negative uh, thereafter, what you find is less than 3% of patients have systemic uh, reactions. Now, if you compare that to what you, when you look at all of the minor determinants, um, the reaction rates are between 1% to 2%. So is that any different? Um, it's hard to know, uh, but it appears to be fairly close. So what we've said in the practice parameter is based on the available literature, skin testing with penicillin polylysine and penicillin G appears to have adequate negative predictive value in the evaluation of penicillin allergy. So even if you don't have minor determinant, you can still uh, use this testing. Now, even if you have minor determinant, it's always recommended to do a penicillin challenge after the skin test is negative. We use amoxicillin and observe them for an hour. Now, the reason we use amoxicillin is uh, for uh, two purposes. Um, well, one is that it's, it's easy to use, and the reality is that most patients aren't getting penicillin, um, and so they're probably going to get some semi-synthetic penicillin afterwards. But the other reason is it takes uh, into account this issue of side chain reactivity to amoxicillin. So if you skin test the penicillin, theoretically, you could miss patients who are side chain sensitive. If you give them amoxicillin afterwards and they tolerate it, you've addressed that question in a more formal manner. Now, can you do when to do penicillin skin testing? Um, I'm an advocate of doing elective penicillin skin testing because it, there's no delay then in terms of when the patient really needs it. You don't have to test them ahead of time. And there's data to show that you can reduce broad spectrum uh, antibiotic use, and it probably uh, saves uh, costs. The main issue with elective penicillin skin testing has been the concern for resensitization. And this has been looked at in several studies, both in pediatrics as well as in adults. This is a study from Rowan Solensky when he was a fellow with us many years ago. And he took patients who were, had fairly convincing histories for IgE-mediated reactions to penicillin and underwent penicillin skin testing. And as one would expect, about 10% had positive penicillin skin tests. And those that were negative then were treated with 10 days of penicillin and then skin tested again. And then they were treated again and skin tested again and treated again and skin tested again. And at the end of the day, nobody converted to a positive skin test despite three separate 10-day courses of penicillin, suggesting that the likelihood of resensitization is indeed quite low. And this has been clearly shown with oral courses of beta-lactam 
there's only one report with intravenous beta-lactam suggesting that there may be a higher rate of sensitization. This has not been uh, reconfirmed, and it's hard to know whether this is in indeed a, a major issue or not. Now, uh, what about amoxicillin? Um, amoxicillin and ampicillin are associated with other forms of non-IgE-mediated reactions, typically these delayed maculopapular exanthems that occur in about 5 to 10 percent of patients. Um, this is not IgE-mediated, but some people have found delayed positive intradermal tests suggesting that it could be T-cell-specific responses, but it's, it's a little unclear whether that's the case or not. There is clearly an association between having Epstein-Barr virus uh, infection and taking amo amoxicillin, and, the, and in children, it's about 100 percent of kids will develop uh, this nonspecific eruption, and it's fairly high in adults as well. As I alluded to, ampicillin side chain reactions is something that is in the literature uh, extensively. Majority of this literature is from Europe, where they find a high percentage of patients who are penicillin skin test negative, but skin test positive to uh, ampicillin. And they actually have a, a parenteral form of amoxicillin that they can skin test patients with, which we don't have. Now, in the United States, we don't see this very often. And people have looked at the value of ampicillin skin testing in finding these patients. And it doesn't appear to be very helpful. So there does appear to be uh, wide differences in this issue between US and Europe. Um, now, there are some side chain uh, that amoxicillin shares with cephalosporins, and it's recommended that you avoid these certain cephalosporins uh, with uh, these patients. Now, what about other beta-lactam cross-reactivity? Um, cephalosporins, monobactams, and carbapenems all share uh, uh, beta-lactam rings, and the issue is, is there a lot of cross-reactivity? With monobactams, there, there is no uh, significant cross-reactivity, and the issue has been more with cephalosporins and carbapenems. Now, you've all heard different statistics uh, in terms of cross-reactivity between cephalosporins and penicillins. But if you take patients with non-severe histories of penicillin allergy, the risk of reacting to cephalosporins is a tenth of one percent. So whether that's really even cross-reactivity or not is difficult to, to know, but it's very, very low. So what's the data behind this? So if you look at patients who are skin test positive to penicillin, only 2% will react to cephalosporins. Now, as we talked about, only 10% of patients labeled as penicillin allergic are skin test positive. So doing the math of this, you come up with about 0.2%. There have been rare reports of fatalities from this, but this is very rare. It's been shown that if you're penicillin allergic and then you're tested and you're negative to penicillin, you can safely tolerate cephalosporins. Now, here are two studies that have looked retrospectively um, at patients who have had histories of penicillin allergy and were given cephalosporins. This was from an, uh, uh, an operative uh, experience where patient, most patients were given cefazolin, 412 out of 413 tolerated the cefazolin uh, during an orthopedic procedure. There was one patient that was given hydrocortisone and Benadryl, but never was reported to have any reaction, and they weren't sure whether this was because they needed steroids for adrenal suppression issues or not. Um, and their only uh, criteria for not giving the cephalosporin was if they had an anaphylactic history to penicillin. This is a study that one of our fellows did a number of years ago looking at our Parkland uh, population, so 600 patients with a history of penicillin allergy who received a number of different cephalosporins, not only first generation but also second and third generation. And again, only one of these patients had an adverse reaction. In this case, Three days later, their eczema got worse. Um, whether that was truly drug-related or not is unclear, but we counted it. Now, the caveat here is that the pharmacist would deny uh, the use of cephalosporins if the patient had a severe, i.e., anaphylactic history to penicillin. 
So again, non-severe histories, penicillin, uh, to penicillin cephalosporins appear to be very well tolerated. And then finally, this was uh, looking at a large um, electronic medical uh, uh, record database from the UK showing that patients who uh, had histories of penicillin allergy and looking at allergic-like events after um, receiving cephalosporins was a little bit higher, but also a little bit higher for sulfonamides too. And the idea is that if you're allergic to drugs, you're probably at a higher risk of reacting to any drug, and that we're not really seeing true immunologic cross-reactivity. And we'll see this play out again in sulfonamides as well. Now, what about carbapenems? The reaction rate here ranges from 0 to 11%. So this all got started with skin testing showing 50% cross-reactivity. But what about real-life reactions? As it turns out, it's quite, much, quite a bit different story. So this is a table outlining retrospective studies here showing ranges from 6 to 11%. But if you look at prospective studies, you can see that essentially none of these patients uh, react. And these were a number of these uh, studies here were carefully identified truly penicillin allergic patients, none of whom reacted to carbapenems. So one uh, possible way of evaluating these patients is to do a skin test with the carbapenem. Um, about less than 1 in 100 patients will have a positive skin test, and it's recommended that you avoid it in these circumstances. And then you can do a one-tenth dosing of the carbapenem, wait an hour, and then give the rest of the carbapenem. Now, what about sulfa and sulfa medications? This is something that a lot of patients come with. So uh, people say they are allergic to sulfa. What they're really typically talking about are sulfonamides, and usually talking about sulfonamide antimicrobials. Sulfonamide antimicrobials are different than sulfonamide non-antimicrobials, and they have different ring structures. And this is a long slide, but the point is, again, there isn't really any issue with sulfonamide um, uh, antimicrobials and risk of the sulfonamide non-antibiotics. Uh, you can give them in these patients. You just need to avoid the sulfonamide antibiotics. Same issue is that if you're a drug allergic, you're more prone to react to just about anything. All right. Key point 10, allergy to local anesthetics, more myth than reality. Um, most of these adverse reactions are non-allergic issues, vasovagal, very common, or perhaps toxic or idiosyncratic reactions to the epinephrine or the local anesthetic given inadvertently parenterally. True IgE-mediated reactions are exceedingly, exceedingly rare. And probably the greater choice, greater challenge is the way to prove this. This is uh, one method of doing this. You can still do skin testing. Skin testing is arguable in terms of whether it is valid or not. There's a lot of studies suggesting it's not helpful. There are some false positives associated with local anesthetic skin testing. But we use it because I think it sets the stage, reassures them a little bit before you end up doing the challenge. This is a challenge that has been recommended by Eric Macy, and there's some published data on this. And I like it because it inserts a placebo um, uh, stage to this. In our experience, local anesthetic rea uh, reactors have a very high uh, reaction rate to placebo. And so I would strongly encourage use of placebo. If you look at this, you can get this whole thing done in a little over an hour and can reassure the patient, reassure the dentist that they can receive these drugs um, without fear. All right, and lastly, uh, I want to talk about aspirin allergy. And there's lots of different types of reactions to aspirin. One that we will see as allergists is something called aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. This is uh, associated with some type of respiratory disorder, whether it's asthma, nasal polyposis, et cetera. And the symptoms they, they get with not only aspirin but other non are predominantly respiratory reactions, especially bronchospasm. This is dependent upon cyclooxygenase 1 inhibition and COX-2 inhibitors generally are safe. But there are other types of reactions. And the way that I think is a practical way of thinking about this is, is are these patients going to be able to tolerate other non -steroidals? And so if you look at those who have AERD, they do have cross-reactivity. 
if you look at patients who have chronic urticaria and their reaction to non-steroidals is urticaria, they also have cross-reactivity. In contrast, the rare patients who have true anaphylaxis to non-steroidals, typically this is a drug-specific reaction. The problem is in patients who don't have chronic urticaria but manifest as urticaria or angioedema, what's their cross-reactivity? They may or may not cross-react, and here you need to do a drug challenge to confirm which way they are. Now, aspirin desensitization can be used, especially in patients with AERD, and this can help their underlying respiratory disorder. Also, in patients with cardiac diseases, there's a different type of so-called desensitization. It may be just a glorified rapid challenge, but it has been useful and uh, can be helpful in managing these patients as well. Lastly, ACE inhibitors, uh, cough is relatively common. Here there is no issue with angiotensin receptor blocking agents. Angioedema, the key thing to remember is the delay in onset. On average, almost two years of taking the ACE before they develop the sporadic angioedema. The angioedema is typically neck and above, rarely is associated with urticaria, and is likely bradykine and mediated. And these patients generally tolerate angiotensin receptor blocking agents. All right, let's go on lastly in the last few minutes to talk about the diagnostic approach to patients with drug allergy. First off is the history, and I think a stepwise history is helpful. The first thing you want to do is determine, is this really allergic or not, or is this an intolerance? Then you want to attempt to try and classify, perhaps on a mechanistic basis. Then figure out which of the drugs in question is likely to cause a, a, a drug reaction. We'll talk about some resources for that. Where there's something else going on that may influence it. In other words, did they have a concomitant viral infection? Do they have chronic urticaria, et cetera? And then you want to evaluate if they had subsequent exposure to the drug. What I mean by that is, especially in penicillin allergic patients, have they taken something like Augmentin before, which they didn't know contained penicillin, but they tolerate it. So you can ask these questions. And lastly, do they actually need the drug again? You don't need to identify, to evaluate every patient with drug allergy. You need to figure out which patients need specific drugs. So a resource for helping you in terms of determining uh, likelihood of given drugs causing different reaction is this LITS. Uh, LITS comes in a book, LITS Drug Reference Manual, and it also is an online database. Now, you have to subscribe to this, and this is something that I didn't even know existed until about a week ago, and so I don't have any experience with this, but this might be something uh, to think about from an in institutional perspective that you can log in and very quickly find out the likelihood of causing specific reactions. And uh, we have used the book a lot, and it's a very useful resource. All right, what are our diagnostic tools in drug allergy? We talked about the history, which is probably the best. I'll briefly touch upon skin testing and in vitro testing, and a little bit about drug challenge as well. Now, skin testing, the take home is you can skin test at just about anything, but what does it mean? And the answer is, First of all, you have to make sure you're skin testing with a non-irritating concentration of the drug. And you can find this for a lot of different drugs, but not all. Um, if it's negative, it doesn't tell you much of anything because the negative predictive value for anything other than penicillin has not been very well established. If it's positive, it does suggest they have drug-specific IgE, and then, therefore, you need to take that into account. And if you, the patient needs the drug, probably you need to desensitize them. Now, what about in vitro tests? There are a host of different in vitro tests for drug allergy. You can summarize the information based on the fact that this has not been very well studied. The studies are relatively small in number. Commercial assays available in the US have not been well studied. And I think I have a big concern that are, are there a lot of positive control sera for these uh, drugs? Probably not. So I don't recommend the use of in vitro tests that are available uh, in this country until more data is available. All right, what about drug challenges? I think drug challenges are underutilized, and I think this is something that you can do. And you can even do this in the office setting. So what we're talking about is a graded challenge. And the key thing is that this is intended for patients who are unlikely to be allergic to the drug. 
It's very different than a desensitization where you think the patient is allergic and you're trying to modify their response. Here, you're just answering the question, are they or are they not allergic? Typically, one can start with one one-hundredth of the dose, or you can start with one-tenth, or sometimes you give them the drug. It all depends on the likelihood that they are allergic or not. And it answers the question, they are allergic or they're not. You can do this for immediate reactions. You can also do it for delayed reactions. So we looked at our experience in terms of the safety of drug reactions in 79 patients with 96 challenges. And what we found was there was a number of patients who had symptoms during the drug challenge. Now, this was very early in the challenge, usually the first step. And we didn't treat these symptoms. They were all subjective symptoms. And we waited for them to go away. And then we gave them higher doses of the drug. And then they did not have any further symptoms. So it doesn't suggest that these were likely drug-related. And this is underscored by the fact that when we use placebo, 7 out of 10 patients reacted to placebo. So you have to be aware of this fact that when you're doing these drug challenges, you may see some symptoms. And you need to ferret out, are these really anxiety symptoms, or are they true drug-related reactions? So what about management? So our choices are, for patients who are drug allergic and needing some drug, is number one, is there an alternative? And that's usually the best thing to look for. If not, your choices are determine if they're allergic by doing a graded challenge, because we don't have a lot of skin tests oftentimes if we're lacking good uh, uh, diagnostic tests, or performing uh, drug desensitization, or as we refer to it in the new practice parameter, induction of drug tolerance. And there are a lot of different methods to do this, this induction of drug tolerance. And this is summarized in this slide here. This is the classic drug desensitization, which is called immunologic IgE induction of drug tolerance, where you're starting with micrograms amounts of drug. You're doubling the dose every 15 minutes. And you can accomplish this an hour. And at the end of the day, you truly do desensitize the patient. However, there are a number of other procedures which may not be desensitizations because the patient may not be truly sensitized and with a variety of different ways. So for example, with allopurinol, you start with milligram amounts and you do this over weeks. Uh, with aspirin, you start with milligram amounts and you do this over days. So there are different protocols for different types of drug reactions. And it's not all one desensitization, one induction of drug tolerance procedure fits all. And you can't do this for every type of reaction. So patients with severe cutaneous reactions should not be desensitized. ACE inhibitors, this will also not work with. So in conclusion, uh, most cases of drug allergy, you can evaluate based on the history and the physical alone. That will get you a lot of information. Skin testing is a limited tool with the exception of penicillin allergy. And I think as allergists, we should employ, employ more graded challenges and then when needed, drug desensitization and induction of drug tolerance procedures. And with that, I'll end and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, is there anybody in the audience that, no, that was amazing. have any questions? Well, I'm going to make you the presenter. Go ahead and click the Show My Screen button. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Dave, I have a couple questions. <laughs> Please. Um, one I was curious about, um, you were talking about with uh, uh, the local anesthetics about giving a placebo. Um, uh, we have patients, and you mentioned a little bit about doing the oral challenges, about people having these kind of, you know, 20% having some sort of um, undefined reaction or whatever. Do you think it's, if you think someone is kind of uh, highly uh, uh, inducible or excitable or nervous that it would be worthwhile to do a placebo uh, step of the greatest challenge for like penicillin or a drug? Yes. So that's, that's an excellent question. And we're, we're actually trying to um, um, figure out, are there certain risk factors for these patients that seem to have more of these subjective symptoms? And one of the things that, that may be useful is when we look at the information, and we looked at the number of drug allergies. If you had only one or two drug allergies on your list, 
it was very rare to experience any type of these subjective symptoms. Uh, and, and so I think that can be a clue to say, you know what, probably we, we, you might not need placebo. The other spectrum is, and, and you know, we had a lot of numbers in terms of drug, so we drew a line in the sand at 10. If you had more than 10 uh, allergies, half of those patients had these subjective symptoms. So I think that's one clue is just looking at the list, how long it is. The longer it is, the more likely you want to do placebo. The other thing is I think if the symptoms are mainly subjective in nature, so that uh, you, know, you, you have nothing really to look at and you're just relying on their symptoms, uh, we do recommend it. And so I think uh, a lot of these patients, if you get the sense that you know, they are uh, you know, nervous, and, and, and most of them, you know, it's understandable. How we explain it is that, okay, you've had a lot of bad experiences to these drugs in the past. It's understandable, and you should be nervous about this procedure. We need to know if the reaction that we're going to be witnessing is nervousness or not, and that's why we're going to be doing placebos. And virtually all the patients are like, yeah, okay, that makes sense to me. Um, and then what I do in the people who are really nervous is I give them lots and lots of placebos until I really get a reaction, and then we give them the drug and show them you know, it really didn't make any difference. Um, so you can, you can pl play this around a lot of different ways um, so that your end result is more uh, clear cut. So I've actually done it a, a few times with some patients when we've done oral challenges to food that are basically pretty nervous to begin with about anything. Um, and we've actually given a placebo uh, stage first um, uh, just because you know, we think they're probably going to have a reaction to anything sort of thing just because they're so nervous. Um, I have another question if nobody else has a question. Oh, actually, Jody has a question. Let's have Jody. Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm over in clinic, and I did miss a, a small portion of the talk. When, when we're diagnosing it as serum sickness, what is the length of time you need to wait before you try to give the patient that drug again? So I guess the question, so serum sickness reactions um, can last uh, for uh, quite some time. So a lot of these patients will remain symptomatic for uh, several weeks. Um, if you, the problem is there's really no good way of, of, diag of, of diagnosing a, the, the culprit drug. Um, so we, we don't really have any assay uh, whether, you know, because if you're looking for specific IgE, uh, that may or may not uh, be, be causative for serum sickness uh, reactions. And so we don't have any methodology for saying, oh, this drug is, is causative. So if you really think the patient had serum sickness to the drug, then you certainly wouldn't want to administer that. But if the issue is they've got, they got four different drugs and you weren't sure which one caused serum sickness, uh, and then at some point you need to administer that again. Uh, I think you'll. The, the, I think the and this I think goes along with all drug reactions, not just serum sickness. The, the problem that we see as allergists is that uh, many people are giving that next drug while the patient has not finished reacting to the first drug. And what invariably happens is they'll have some reaction that is attributed to the second or third drug, and now you've just increased the list of drug allergies, when in reality, their drug reaction is waxing and waning over time and hasn't resolved. So I think you have to wait long enough for it to be gone. The problem with the serum sickness uh, reintroducing it is uh, it's hard to know how long you need to keep the patient on the drug before before you're going to have a, 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 a reaction. So. They're very difficult, I would say, in terms of, 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 of assessing. So I'm not sure if, I, if I've answered your question or not. Well, you know, Dave, uh, in, in pediatrics, it's actually one of the most common types of reactions. We don't see that many IgE reactions, but we see a lot of patients who are given a course of a drug, and it's about seven or day, eight days into the course, they will start to develop a rash and, and symptoms that are, that are consistent with serum sickness. So you, you kind of know what the drug is. But, um, you know, then it becomes a real issue. They want to know, um, can I take the drug later on after they've uh, resolved? And most of the time, we just give them a challenge, and they don't have a reaction. 
So in your experience, the, the patients are able to tolerate the drug which was uh, implicated with the serum sickness reaction? No, almost always. That's interesting. Because uh, it's, it's, uh, that would be something that would be good to get out in the literature because there's not a lot of, that's one of the things that, you know, with, we know a lot about IgE-mediated reactions. We, we have some information about some of the more severe reactions, but things like serum sickness, there's not a lot of this type of information uh, out there. So that would be, I think, useful to know if, and I think that's the suggestion mm -hmm. that I hear, um, you know, in terms of cross-reactivity, certainly, that there doesn't appear to be a lot of cross-reactivity with these serum sickness reactions among cephalosporins and things. But uh, there's not a lot of data, even retrospective, that would be, I think that would be helpful if, if that's been your experience. Dave, I have one more question if we got a minute here left. Um, <clears throat> um, for some of these non-IG mediated reactions, you mentioned uh, some of these um, in, in vitro testing that um, um, haven't really been um, um, uh, proven to be to be all that good. Um, but there's, with, especially with dress and some of these other kind of uh, syndromes that are occurring, there's 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 been a concern, especially if there's been multiple drugs been involved, like the dress syndrome, about trying to distinguish which drugs may be the culprit. And um, do you see any role? And I, I know there's there's some places that will do lymphocyte transformation. Uh, but of uh, doing um, either patch testing or, as you mentioned earlier, um, doing like an ID to some of these drugs? Yeah, so um, the in terms of dress, uh, patch testing and delayed intradermal tests have not been found to be uh, very useful. And in fact, there have been some case reports of patients developing dress from doing an intradermal uh, test to the culprit drug. So. Uh, the recommendation is probably to avoid using those type of uh, in vivo tests. Uh, the lymphocyte transformation um, is probably uh, the best test for uh, DRESS. Um, the problem is, is that the, these statistics come from research laboratories that have worked out all the bugs, and there's a lot of bugs with lymphocyte transformation, and so even these people don't seem to trust commercial uh, assays. And so that's the problem. If you run five drugs and you run it to this commercial assay and, you know, maybe one pops up, is, is, is that really the one and is that strong enough to, to hang your hat on? It, I just don't know. And it, it, it'd be nice. And maybe, maybe it'd be something to, to collect some information on and probably need to do that. Um, I think that's the that's the concern. But I think so. I think you could get it, but is it going to helpful? Is it going to help you? Uh, it, it, it's hard to know. But I would caution uh, doing either patch or intradermal uh, delayed intradermals for these because it it, it it doesn't seem to be helpful. What about what about for some of the non-dressed kind of the you know, non-Ig reactions? Uh, yeah. So for uh, maculopapular exanthems. Uh, delayed intradermal tests and patch testing has often been found to be helpful. If you look at, uh, in general, uh, delayed intradermal tests are probably a little bit better than patch testing for most uh, of these kind of non-immediate type reactions. And so, and the patch testing is a little bit more cumbersome. We're used to doing a lot of intradermal tests, so I think this is something that we probably need to be doing a little bit more of for these delayed reactions is doing delayed intradermal tests. Um, and uh, so you can you can do it for a lot of these other, especially exanthems and uh, um, uh, radio contrast reactions has been maybe helpful for uh, these delayed reactions. So. And what would you expect that the time span with that would be? 36, 48 hours longer. What's your when you've done the intradermal? When you think you're going to more likely to see a reaction if it's positive? Yeah. So um, the the first, it's usually recommended that you do your first read a little bit earlier than you would like for a patch test. So you want your first read at about 24 hours, um, and then probably your final read at between uh, 48 to 72. What we typically will do is we'll have them come back in 24 hours, and you know if we kind of trust the patient, you know, 
and, and there's nothing there, just have them come back. If they, if they have anything that pops up, have them come back so we can take a look at it. Um, that, that, that saves them a little bit of effort. Okay. Well, um, we're running out of time, and I want to once again thank um, Dave for um, um, giving this talk. It was excellent as usual, and um, thanks again, Dave. Um, My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Okay. Bye-bye. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.